Good morning or good afternoon. Welcome everyone. So today we present a live expert series webcast and our topic will be Cisco Unified Computing System UCS B series upgrade and troubleshooting. My name is Satish Chandran and I'll be moderating today's webcast. Our experts joining me today, Varun Mehta, who is a customer support engineer from the server virtualization team at the Cisco Technical Assistance Center in Bangalore, India. He has five years of total experience working on a wide range of Cisco products. He also holds a CCI in routing and switching. Our second expert is Anupam Astana, also a customer support engineer from the server virtualization team here at Cisco Tag Bangalore. He has over nine years of total experience and worked on wide range of Cisco data center products such as Cisco UCS, Cisco Nexus 1000V. Welcome Varun, welcome Anupam. Hello. Hello guys, I am Varun and I'll be covering the UCS uh, architecture and the troubleshooting section. Hi everyone, this is Anupam. Today I will be covering the UCS upgrade part of our presentation. Great. So joining our experts today is Avinash Shukla, who is a team lead for the same virtual uh, server virtualization team at the Cisco TAC here at Bangalore. He has more than six years of total experience and also a CCI in voice and data center. So he's a double CCI. He has worked with wide range of Cisco products and technology. Welcome Avinash as a panelist. Hey guys, thank you so much. Thanks Adish. Okay, so now I'd like to briefly outline the format for today's Expert Series webcast. Varun and Anupam will start with a presentation for the first 60 minutes of the program, and then we will dive into the live question submissions for the remainder of the event. During our live presentation, you may ask, sub, uh, or, ask or submit questions to be answered by Varun and Anupam and Avinash using the Q&A box, which is located at, on the right-hand side of the console. The team of experts is well versed in Cisco Unified Computing System B series upgrade and troubleshooting. So please begin posting your questions now to give them the best chance of answering them. Also, if you experience any technical issues, please post your questions. We will be asking polling questions during the webcast and we highly encourage you to participate by answering them. And uh, as you see on the slide, you may download a copy of today's PDF presentation using the link in the chat window. Now let's get started with today's event. So let's start with first polling question for uh, you. And the question is, do you use UCS in your company infrastructure? The option A, yes, I'm using it. Option B, not yet, but I plan to use in future. Option C, no, I'm not using it. Option D, it's not applicable. So the polling question, let me, let me open the polling question one. Okay, so poll is on the right hand side of the console. Thank you for your responses. Okay, and make sure to submit your questions and we will answer them later in the webcast. Now I'd like to hand the mic to Varun who will start the presentation followed by Anupam. Over to you Varun. Thank you Satish. Hello everyone. So let's get started with the UCS architecture. I'll explain you in brief the UCS architecture, the various components that make the unified computing system as in a whole unified computing system. So let's get started. So uh, the agenda for the day is uh, we'll be going through the introduction on the UCS, the upgrade, as well as the troubleshooting, troubleshooting in general for UCS. So uh, let's start get started with the architecture. So this is a ba basic UCS architecture. Uh, just listed out the basic building blocks. So it consists of fabric interconnects, uh, I/O modules, your endpoint that is your blade servers, which uh, and we have internal components inside a blade. Uh, 
for uh, those are like CIMC, BIOS, adapters, the, the, I'm speaking about the converged network adapters, storage controller, board controllers. So we'll be uh, going ahead, we are going to discuss each component in detail. So this is a pictorial representation of a UCS system. So uh, I've just uh, taken out the latest product models that we support. So as you can see out here, So you can see out here that this is a fabric interconnect. Uh, I've just uh, listed 6 to 48. We also have 60 to 96 with 96 ports. Uh, the UCSM, uh, which is embedded in the fabric interconnect. Uh, you can see out here, we are, uh, you can see that we are using 2208. This is your IO module, PEX module, which, is in, which sits inside on the rear side of the chassis. This is a UC, uh, chassis uh, which hosts maximum eight blades in a single chassis. Here you can see few blades that have been listed. Uh, these are your blade servers. So I've listed B220, uh, B22M3, B200M3, B420M3. We can also have uh, the rack mount servers that are your C series servers. Uh, we can integrate them uh, with the UCSM. They can be managed through UCSM. Uh, depending on the UCSM firmware version, you can either directly connect them to the FIs or you can connect them using the 2232 fabric extender. And these are a few models of C-series that I've listed out here, uh, C22M3, C24M3, 240. These are 22 is one rack unit, 24 is two racks unit. So uh, you can, the pictorial representation, uh, you can go through it. So let's, uh, let's concentrate on the fabric interconnect right now. So what is a fabric interconnect? So it's, it's a switch, uh, basically a switch, which has some additional capabilities. It, it's, it's based on the N5K architecture, but it also, it's running a, something special, uh, it's running a different software, which supports the normal SAN, as well as it, it has the UCSM integrated into it. So on, a, so on the uh, fabric interconnect, we can configure the ports uh, depending on our requirement. We can configure them as server ports. Uh, they are also known as the southbound ports, which go to your IO modules, that is to your blade chassis. So these uh, ports for, provide connectivity to your servers. We also have the network ports. Uh, these network ports, they can connect to the uplink ethernet or the SAN switches. So based on your requirement, you can have N5K, 7K, or 653750, any, any uh, switch, uh, the upstream switch that can be connected to the uh, fabric interconnect. Similarly, for storage, you can have MDS, or you can have any brocade switch, any whatever is your requirement, you can have them connected to the network ports. The fabric interconnect has one management port that is used for the outer band management. It has two clustering ports. We, if you see the, I'll show it to you in the uh, going ahead. So we have two ports. They are called as the L1, L2 ports. These ports are used to keep the, if you're using the FIs in HA, that is in high availability mode, if you want to form a cluster. So in that case, these ports are used and we just connect, uh, they are just, uh, they're just used for exchanging the clustering information, they have no role in the data path. As always, we also have a console port. A console port is used for troubleshooting any issues on the FI, and also when you're uh, configuring your FI for the first time. <coughs> so this is a, I've just uh, picked one module. Uh, so this is, let's speak about 6248 Fabric Interconnect. So as you can see here, it has 32 fixed ports. Fixed ports, as in when you order a 6248, it will be shipped with 32 ports. You can order an expansion module, we call it a gem module as well. So if you order an expansion module, you can get these extra 16 ports. Okay, so let's uh, just concentrate on the left side out here. As you can see out here, it's, uh, it's, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if it's visible, but out here you can see it's L1, L2. So these are the uh, two ports where you, uh, both the FIs would be connected. You, they can be connected directly so that they form a cluster. Out here, you can see the management port. This management port is used to assign an IP to the cluster, uh, to the fabric interconnect. So you can connect it to your management switch in the upstream. This is your console port out here. We have two, uh, two fan modules out here. Obviously, for redundancy, we have two. And similarly, we have two power and resource. Uh, one important point that I want to cover out here is with the 6248, uh, these ports are unified ports. So you can configure them as either, you can use them as either Ethernet ports or Etsy ports. So in, a, in if you launch the UCSM manager, you get an option to configure the unified ports. So depending on your requirement, you can either have them as uh, 10 or 1 gig Ethernet ports or 1, 2, 4, 8 gigs Etsy ports. 
Let me, uh, yeah, one more requirement that I wanted to let you know is Ethernet, Ethernet ports can be configured always from left to right, whereas the FC ports can be configured from right to left. And uh, the port numbering uh, always starts from an odd number, as in you can end your Ethernet ports out here. So if it ends here, it has to, the FC, first FC port would start here. So you need to be very careful during the port assignment. Uh, this slide gives you a, uh, a, just speaks about the various fabric interconnect models that we have right now, 6248 and the 6296. The major difference between them is one has 48 ports and the other one has 96 ports. Again, these are unified ports. 48 as in 32 fixed, 16 uh, in the gem module, the expansion module. All can be configured as per your requirement, either SC or Ethernet. 48 ports, uh, the 6248 is one rack unit, whereas the 6296 is two racks unit because it has more ports. This slide also outlines uh, the IO modules, uh, the modules that we support. So as you can see, uh, it speaks about 2204 and 2208. Uh, 2204 gives 80 gigs to the chassis and uh, uh, 2208 gives 160 gigs to the chassis. 20 gig per plate, 40 gig per plate. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you might be thinking about how I would derive these numbers. So once I speak about IO modules, I'll explain you the calculation that goes behind this uh, capacity that we are speaking of. Uh, one more thing, uh, right now, uh, earlier in the 2104, we couldn't have um, port channels between the IO and the FI. The, these links are called the fixed fabric links. Uh, with these models, 2204 and 2208, we have now, we can form a port channel between the IOM and the Fabric Interconnect. So yeah, pretty much the same thing that we spoke of earlier. These are unified ports, can be configured for either Ethernet or fiber channel. So this is how we provide more dynamism uh, to our customers. So uh, depending on your requirement, you can just uh, configure your unified ports and use them as either Ethernet or as FC. So this is a, the UCSM GUI. I guess all of you might have had a look at it once at least. So out here you can see this is, uh, once you log in into the UCSM, uh, this is uh, under the equipment tab. You can see it lists that there's one chassis out here. It also lists the servers. So this is uh, the pictorial representation of UCSM. So what is UCSM? As I said, UCSM is uh, it's a, it's a something that's integrated in the FI. It's used for the single point of contact for device management, as in you can configure your entire UCS using the UCSM. So as uh, in Nexus 5K, you, we don't have CLI. Uh, we do have CLI for the FIs, but uh, it's only read-only. The NXOS CLI is only read-only. So all the config that needs to be done is done through UCSM. You can also have role-based authentication. You can also integrate your UCSM through your, to your Active Directory, LDAP. We also have, uh, you can create various roles. You can, uh, as per the roles you have created, you can, uh, the different users will have different, uh, uh, as in the privileges. Chassis. We, I spoke about chassis. Let's uh, look at it in detail. I'm speaking about the 5108. So uh, uh, right now the chassis that we have uh, supports uh, at the max eight server modules. So the servers are numbered from uh, left to uh, starting from the topmost uh, left corner to the bottommost right corner. So this is server one, server two, server three, server five, server six, and so on. So I wanted to mention one more thing. The, the server options, you can have two types of servers. Either they can be half-width blades or they can be full-width. In, in our case, as you can see out here, we have one and two as half-width and three is full-width. So in that case, you would see that the server slot four is missing because server three has occupied it. So at the max, if you're using um, all half width blades, so you can reach to, you can uh, conf, uh, you can have eight blades in the chassis. So this is the front side of the chassis, wherein you can see the blades. Uh, I will show you the rear side of the chassis. The rear side, here is where the uh, FI sits. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, miss, uh, this is where the IM sits. So this is your IM out here, out here to the extreme left, and out here, this is IM1, and this is IM2. This is your power supplies out here, and these are your fan modules out here. Uh, this is also uh, giving you once again the FIs. So this is giving you the holistic picture of the entire UCS system. So let's concentrate on IO modules. What are IO modules actually? They just extend the fabric. So basically uh, they are like uh, distributed line cards. They are under the control of the fabric interconnect. So they provide proxy management control to the blades. Right. So depending on uh, the, uh, the IO module that you use, uh, there are uh, you can have either four to eight ports to your FI, 
and either uh, 8 to 32 ports to your blades. So we'll speak about the uh, different IO modules. I'll cover that going ahead. So yeah, here's the contrast slide. Uh, so the first generation of IO modules, the 2104s, these had 8 into 10 gig HIF ports. Now, the first question that arises is what is HIF port? HIF as in host interface, these are the server facing ports. This will go to your, from the IO module, these are the backplane ports. These are not visible, as in you cannot uh, plug in. Uh, it's at the backplane, this will connect to your blade. And the 4 into 10 gig NIF ports, NIF as in the network interface, these ports are also called as the FEX fabric ports. This will go to your upstream fabric interconnect. So with the 2504, you have 8 into 10 gig. So if you're using all the 8 servers, each server would get 10 gig. And 4 into 10 gig NIF ports. This is going to your fabric interconnect. Similarly, if you see the 2208, this is a second generation of IO modules that we have. It has 32 into 10 gig HIF ports. Again, HIF ports are the server ports going to your server. So 32 divided by 8. I'm speaking about 32 divided by 8 in case I have a fully loaded chassis with 8 half width blades. So each blade would get eight a up four into ten that is forty gigs of uh, bandwidth and eight into ten gig that are your NIF port that is eighty gigs throughout uh, to your fabric interconnect. So this is how it will look out here. If you, you know, go to your IO model on the UCSN, you can see these black plane ports, the thirty two ports that we spoke of, and the fabric ports. These are the eight ports that you can see out here on the IO model. You cannot see the back plane ports on the IO model, whereas these ports are the fabric ports. So, uh, as you can see out here in the backplane ports, we have 2 slash 1. And you might be thinking, why do we have 2 slash 5? Because uh, the rest of the ports 2 slash 2, 2 slash 3, and 2 slash 4 are not enabled in, uh, in the blade 1. So, we just have one port at the moment. So, uh, let's uh, speak about the pinning that happens. Uh, spinning in the sense, the backplane ports, the server facing ports, and to the network facing ports. So IM is basically the module which will connect your blades to your fabric interconnect. So there has to be a mapping. So if I just have one flex fabric link, the NIF port, one link going to your fabric interconnect, and I have eight slots, all the eight slots as in all the blades being uh, are you there in the slots and they're running up. So in that case, all the eight blades will be mapped to the single NIF that I have. In case I have two NIF ports, that is the flex fabric links, so in case of two, as you can see out here, the alternate blades would be pinned to the, uh, like blade one would pin, be pinned to NIF one, blade two to NIF two, blade three again to one, and blade four again to two. So it's it goes in a cyclic way. Similarly, uh, see, uh, the, HIV, the NIF ports, one thing to consider out here, you can have either one, two, four, or eight NIF ports. It's always, um, uh, it's a multiple of two. Okay, and it's a multi, uh, and you need to be very careful out here. See out here when we have four uh, flex fabric ports. So in that case, you can see blade one will go to first NIF, blade two to second, blade three to third, blade four to fourth, and similarly the cycle will keep on rotating. This is for I'm speaking about 2208 because this has eight flex fabric links. Similarly, if all of them, all the flex fabric links are utilized. So in that case, each blade would be mapped to a particular one single NIF, the flex fabric link. Now what happens in case of a failover? In case if one of the links out here fails, right? So what will happen in that case? The server that's on that link will lose data path. However, since we have connectivity through IMB, the connectivity would still be there. It will fall back, and as I told you earlier, since we use only one, two, three, uh, sorry, one, two, four, and eight link topologies. So in case if one of the links of the four links go down, so it will fall back to two links, right? And to get the pinning up and so that the servers are mapped again, to clear the faults, a react is required on the chassis. So let's look at blade. What is a blade? Uh, I'm seeing about a half width blade out here. So I've just, uh, this is a B200 M3 blade. So as you can see, what does a blade consist of? First of all, this is a system board, the motherboard of your blade, you can say. It has, uh, out here you can see, depending on the blade model, here we have two CPUs. Uh, depending on the DIMM population rules and uh, how you want to configure DIMM, uh, each CPU has DIMM slots up and below it. So you can configure the DIMMs out here. 
uh, you can see out here we have a mesh slot for this is for your this is a, uh, for your CNA the conversion network adapters or also for your rate controllers and also we have a LOM slot out here. We also have an internal USB port out here and you can see these are your HDD slots hard drives you can uh, either place SAS or SATA drives. So this is how in the back plane, the, this is your blade out here, you can see this is your mesh slot, the MLOM slot that we speak of, LOM in, in the sense LAN on motherboard, so and mesh is mesh 9 slot. So as you can see out here, uh, this is how the connectivity is there uh, through the, this is through your uh, whatever adapter you have placed, we have various options, uh, we have 1240, 1280 which are Cisco Wix, you can also go for MLX, QLogic depending on your requirement. So I'm going to speak about uh, Wix 1280 as an example. So it has 10 uh, DC ports, uh, sorry, 8 10 gig DC ports. That means 8 ports to the IM. So out here you can see that it will have 8 ports going to the IM out here. So this is just the statistics that it's giving. Uh, so when pair, uh, when this, then we are using a Wix 1280 with whether 6248 and 2208 IM. The max you can get is 128 width. I've given in the reference slide how, how do we reach to this calculation. And with UCS 21, uh, sorry, 6120 and the first uh, the first generation of FIs and the IMs, you can have a maximum of 64 widths. Widths are virtual interfaces, the virtual interfaces that you can create on the adapter. So uh, I'll just, uh, the UCS, uh, you should be very sure on the connectivity. So this is, this is what we support. So the connect, always keep one thing in mind, uh, the connectivity between the IM and the FI is always 1 is to 1. So you can have your uh, one IM going to one FI, as you can see to out here to your left uh, corner. Here it shows that IM1 is going to fabric A, for example, and IM2 is going to fabric B. This is a supported configuration. Also you can have your IM1 going to fabric B, IM2 going to fabric A. That's fine, you can do a crosswire, that's, that's not an issue as long as there is one is to one mapping between the IM and the fabric contact, uh, interconnect. However, you can see out here, you know, it shows that this IM1 is connected to the same, both the fabrics. This is not supported. As I said, it has to be one is to one. And vice versa out here, you see that we have just one fabric interconnect and two IMs going to it. This is also not supported. So this is how your entire system will look uh, once you have configured everything. So this is, these are your fabric interconnects, these are your server ports. So you make sure that you configure these ports as server ports on your fabric interconnect. These are your network ports. So either they can be Ethernet or FC. These are your Ethernet and these are your FC ports out here. And that's it. That is what it speaks about. So uh, what makes UCSM so special, right? The basic uh, thing about UCSM is stateless computing, the service profiles that we have. It adds dynamism. So what are we doing? So in the traditional server uh, market, we had a separate storage administrator who is to configure your LANs for masking, binding, boot LANs and everything. And also does your zoning, uh, creates your vSANs and everything. And uh, we also had a network administrator who would take care of the network, the LANs, the VLANs, uplinks, configure QS policies, ACLs and all that. And also the server administrator would look, in, would look into the server hardware the BIOS, the SMC settings, and the base management controller settings and all that. So now with UCSM, we have a solution wherein a single administrator can do all of this together. So what what uh, the stateless co computing, what we, have, what we have done is we have added service profiles. So what a service profile, it's an abstract. So you can have, in a service profile, we can define policies and pools for each of the like whatever the network administrator, storage administrator, all the tasks can be done together. You can create pools for your Macs, for your WPNs, for your UUIDs, VLAN assignments, and associate it to a blade. This, uh, one sec, as you can see out here, so you have a, so in this example, you see that we have a service profile named Finance01, the UID is this, Mac address, boot order, whatever you have set it to. So in in case of like if there's a hardware failure on your blade or in case of a maintenance or you want to do an ha hardware upgrade on your infra, so in that case, you, the only thing that you need to do is you just dis disassociate your service profile from an old server and move it to the new one. And the old one can be upgraded or whatever changes you want to do, you can do. So this is how the service profile creation you can do. You can, uh, it is done under the service tab. If you go to root and you can go to create service profile expert, you can use that and create the service profile. 
So there are various pools and policies, templates that you can create in a service profile. So I'll be just covering them overly. So pools, pools are like uh, predefined resources. So once you say that you are supposed to use a pool, it will look into that pool and retrieve data from it. Like uh, I can create a WPN pool, I can create a Mac pool, a VLAN pool, a server pool. So it knows a pool from where it can fetch the data. Policies, different policies we have. We have the host firmware policy, the adapter policies. So these policies are something that you can, uh, it should work the uh, rules. They are the rules that uh, you should, uh, the adapter should follow. Templates, as in I can, uh, uh, the common configuration that we have with the policies and uh, uh, pools that we have created, if you want to replicate them, you can create templates and just use them over and over. For example, I can create a VNIC template and assign it to my NICs so that I, all the NICs have the same kind of configuration. So I, I, I don't need to do the configuration individually on all the NICs. So for managing, as I said, pools, uh, so this, let's say the same thing. You can have your Mac pools, WWN pools, UID pools. There are different kinds, all, all the pools. I'm just stated three. There are a lot many. So the server pool is uh, like similarly, whatever servers are free, uh, it will automatically choose a server from the pool and assign the service profile to it. You can either assign it manually as well. You can select a, a, select a server and assign a service profile to it. So yeah, so this is what it says. It's policy-driven management. So you have your service profile. You have your, you can create your boot policy. You can have your adapter policy. So it just speaks about that. So just policy types. You can have your BIOS policies, boot policies. Whether you want to boot it from local disk, LAN, SAN, Pixie boot, CD drive, whatever. Host firmware policy that's used for upgrading the Blade firmware. You can have your maintenance policy. It is like any any change that's done to the Blade. You can, uh, by default, it is immediate, so the server would reboot. Immediately, you change something in the maintenance policy. You can change it to user act. We have scrub policy, as this will help you uh, uh, in case what, what should be done if a service profile is disassociated to the local drives. So I just I have taken a few slides for RMA in case, and this will help you in case you are referring to TAC if you want a replacement. Be sure you give us the serial number. And in case if you are replacing the part on your own, be sure that you follow the ESD guidelines. If possible, you can have the field engineer also, depending on the contract that you have with us. One more special note with the CPUs on M3 servers, you cannot replace them directly. There's a special tool that you need to be aware of. The detail is given in the link there. So just follow the guidelines before replacing the CPU. So here's your polling question too. Do let us know uh, what do you expect from us and uh, what what topics would you be interested in uh, so that we can deliver sessions on them. Thank you. So I'll hand over to uh, Anupam right now. He'll take you to the upgrade and I'll come once again for the troubleshooting. Thank you guys. So the poll, uh, second poll is open on the right hand side. Please record your responses. Okay, we'll take a few seconds, then uh, we'll hand over the mic to Anupam. Thank you.
Hi everyone, this is Anupam here. I'll be continuing with the UCS upgrade part of uh, the presentation today. So I see that uh, a number of you have voted and you would like uh, a LAN or network troubleshooting uh, to be our next session. So I will uh, probably work on it. It's uh, good to know that uh, you know, you've know you shown the interest. So now uh, getting back to the topic, uh, as I said, I'll be covering the upgrade part. So it will also have a live demo of the upgrade. So to start with, uh, I'll start with what do we need to consider before we uh, perform our upgrade. So the most important thing is that we should always consult our release notes and the upgrade guide. They will always cover any concerns or any issues that uh, can be you know, encountered during the upgrade. So do go always and uh, you know, um, carefully read the release notes and upgrade guides. <coughs> Also, check the release notes about the prior versions as well as the future versions so that you understand if there is any difference in terms of features or anything else that we need to be aware of before we perform the upgrade. Now, it's also important to schedule a maintenance window because your infrastructure components like the uh, Fabric Interconnect and the IOM will reboot during the upgrade. Now, if we do not want to uh, have a downtime, we can make sure beforehand that we have network and storage redundancy that we have network and storage connectivity via both fabrics so that we don't have any loss of connectivity yes we would be losing paths on one side of the fabric when this happens so it's always suggested to have a maintenance window when we do this it's always also highly recommended to back up the ucsm configuration it's also mentioned as a very important step in the upgrade guide Included a URL where you can find some upgrade guide and videos on how to go about performing the upgrade. A couple of other things to note is uh, that uh, it's not possible for the QA to have tested almost all configurations because there can be innumerable possibilities of uh, connectivity, topology, and uh, you know scale in terms of number of chassis and servers. So there can be issues, but we are always there to help you. And lastly, the upgrade process sometimes is not that quick. So both the infrastructure as well as the blade upgrade will take about 20 to 25 minutes. So we have to sometimes be patient. It may look like it's not working or not going through, but it is. So just uh, allow it enough time. Now, sometimes we need to downgrade. Uh, generally, a downgrading is done if we are doing an upgrade and something has not worked, uh, some issue has come up, this operation is not always tested and it can be disruptive because uh, we have new features that may have uh, got activated uh, in the new release and if we downgrade, they may stop working. So always uh, consider uh, what uh, you know, you're downgrading to and make sure uh, that you have uh, all the uh, information that is required. You see some backup as always is always recommended in case if we need to downgrade and restore from the backup. The first step, uh, you know, that we follow in terms of um, getting our UCS firmware upgraded is that we download the firmware from Cisco.com. So I've just included a screenshot here. We can go to the download, uh, sorry, downloads uh, under support and then select the product, server, unified computing, download the version that you require. Currently, the latest release is uh, 222C or 2223C, uh, um, but we would be using 222C for our demo purpose today. So once it has been downloaded, we need to upload the image from our client machine onto the UCS manager. So this is a screenshot that shows how we do it. So uh, we go to the uh, we go to the equipment tab, and then on the main panel, we click on firmware management, and we click on download tasks, and we create a download task, and then we upload the image. I'll also show you how exactly to do this on the live demo once uh, you know I've started it. So once uh, the bundles are upgraded, you would be able to see all the packages under the packages tab like this. It will show each and every package that is currently available on the uh, UCS manager. And once they're all available, we can start with our 
upgrade process. Okay. So today I will be covering two types of upgrade processes that Cisco now uh, provides. First one is a manual upgrade, and second is the auto install, which is available after UCS 2.1. So the manual upgrade has been always available. Uh, that's the standard method that has been available. When each component or endpoint is to be manually updated. When I say endpoint, endpoint means each uh, component like a CIMC, BIOS, storage adapter, etc. So in this case, each and every step has to be done manually. You have to select each and every firmware or each and every component firmware manually and then perform the upgrade. Also, uh, we have to follow the the steps as given in the guide in the sense uh, if the guide says you have to com update component X before component Y, then we have to follow that order manually when doing a manual upgrade. Auto install makes things quite easy for us. So it has been an ARC and with UCS 2.1 it is uh, now available. If you are re updating from prior to release 2.1, you can manually upgrade your UCS manager to 2.1 and then use the auto install feature. Uh, as the name suggests, uh, it's system controlled. It uh, you know automates uh, things for us. We have to perform very few operations, and the system takes care of the rest of the things. Uh, it takes care of the order of the activities that have to be performed, and also uh, it takes care of all the uh, endpoints that have to be upgraded. So now, um, before we uh, you know begin with the uh, actual uh, demonstration, uh, let's do a quick run through on the manual install procedure. So uh, once again, always consult the release notes. Uh, upgrade from the GUI is the easiest thing to do. That's what we would be showing today. Okay. So the general process is that we back up the UCSM, we download the code, which we have already done, and then we upload it to the UCS manager. Then we go ahead and update the components, and then we activate the components in order uh, of uh, you know the release notes. So the order in which the components are upgraded is always uh, specified or dictated by the release notes. This order can change from one release to other, so be careful. Uh, have a look at the release notes before we go ahead, uh, you know, to do the upgrade. Uh, so a general order that is specified here is the interface card and the CIMC, which are the components of the blade, and then the infrastructure firmware, which is the IOM, UCSM, and Fabric Interconnect. Now, I talked about two things here, update and activate, so I'll also let you know what exactly uh, is that. So when we say update, update is only copying the image to the endpoint or the backup partition of the endpoint. So this is not a disruptive step, this is only copying the image, and this we can do to all the devices, like if you have 20 blades, we can update the firmware on 20 at the same time. The actual firmware upgrade process begins with the activate. When we click on activate, that's when the backup partition is set to active. So the backup version would become, the, or the startup version would now become active. The device would normally reboot, uh, be it any component, uh, FI, IOM, UCS manager, even the blades, they will all reboot and reboot with the new startup version and that will become the active version. This is a disruptive step, this requires a device reboot and uh, in here we need to follow a specific order dictated by the documentation or the upgrade guide. Okay. So with this we jump into the live demo part of it, so I'll quickly show you how do we do the upgrade. Um, okay. So I'll uh, share my screen. So uh, if anyone is having any issues with uh, looking at the screen, just let me know. I can put it on the Q&A panel. Okay. So now, um, as suggested, so what we do is, first thing is that we go ahead and upgrade. So I'll show you what exactly or how exactly we do it. 
So we click on equipment and we go to firmware management and we go to download tasks. We can create a download task by clicking on the plus sign here. Local file system, we can browse and then we can select an image on your desktop like this one. So I've already done this, so I'm not going to uh, do this once again. This is just for demonstration purposes. Okay. Now, uh, once uh, both the packages have been uploaded, uh, we can see the packages listed under the Packages tab. Now, we do see two kinds of packages here, Bundle and Infra, or rather B-Series and Infra. So we must be wondering what exactly is this. So the B-Series bundle, uh, this contains the firmware upgrade code for your blades. This includes the blades BIOS, CIMC, the adapters, any kind of you know 1240, 1280, MAT1KR, and other uh, legacy adapters as well. It also includes the code for some uh, basic RAID controllers that we have on the blades and the board controller on the blade. The infrastructure bundle contains the firmware code for your IOM, your fabric interconnect, that's the NXOS, and the UCS manager code as well. Okay. So now what we will do is we will start with the upgrade process. So the first step in the upgrade process uh, going by the upgrade guides is generally update and activate the IOM. So that's the first thing that we will do. So we'll go to the firmware management tab, we'll go to installed firmware, and that is of course we are first starting off with the manual upgrade process, which I'll show. And then uh, I will later demonstrate how do we uh, you know, perform the auto install. So, so the first thing is that uh, we go to the firmware management, we click on install firmware, and we can just expand uh, the listing here. So we see two IOMs in chassis one, so that's what we are uh, going to upgrade. So then we click on update firmware. So we'll just select the firmware that we plan to use, click on apply, and click on OK. Now, it does say that it's updating, but this is only basically copying the image to this backup partition, so there is no impact to the system right now. Secondly, we'll go ahead and activate oh, once uh, this is done. Now, it's important that we choose the set startup version only in here, otherwise the device uh, will reboot. Okay. Now, the next step in this process is to upgrade our UCS manager. So we'll uh, go to the UCS manager. Now, the UCS manager is a single or an active component. So it does not require to be updated first and activated. So we can go ahead and straight away um, move to activate the firmware on UCS Manager. So this is the component here. Select this, and select Skip Validation, click on Apply, click OK. So now the UCS Manager upgrade is scheduled. It would copy the image for the UCS manager and it would reboot only the UCS manager component. So when this happens, you would see that UCS manager will disconnect because it needs to reboot itself and update. So there's nothing to be worried about. This is the normal process. It should take about three to five minutes uh, normally for uh, the UCS manager to come up once uh, you know it has uh, disconnected after a reboot. We have to give it some time for uh, that to happen. So while this is um, while this is uh, you know being done, uh, we can also have a look at the slides once again to recapitulate on what we did. Okay, so this is uh, what we followed. You can go to the update firmware section and then expand the list and select all the components that you want. We are following the order described by the upgrade guide, so we selected the IOMs. 
and then we activated it. So we said uh, sometimes it can take a little bit of time. Uh, update process uh, does not work for the FI or the uh, UCSM. So that's uh, what we did. Now, okay. so we'll come to the blade um, firmware upgrade later on. So this is what we did. The uh, we activated the UCSM. This will cause the UCSM to disconnect. Uh, as I said, it will take a few minutes and then it should come back. And once it does, we will uh, do the FI firmware update. So I'll just show you because uh, the pop-up has just appeared. So now you see this is a pop-up which has appeared, uh, which says that uh, you know we are unable to connect to the UCS manager. So at this stage, we can just exit. Um, it will take a few minutes, and once it's ready, we'll start with the FI upgrade process. This is just to show you. We'll jump back to the slides. Okay. So I said um, we will be doing the fabric interconnect activation. Oh, sorry. I do not see. Okay. Sorry, uh, just uh, interrupt me or put a question in the Q&A panel if you're unable to see any content that uh, I am talking about. Okay, so now uh, we are looking at the slides back again because we are waiting for the UCS manager to come up after the upgrade. So once this is done, we would be continuing with the fabric interconnect upgrade. Uh, we would be, of course, doing one fabric at a time, which is very important because if we upgrade both fabrics at a time, they will both reboot and bring down all connectivity to our servers. So we don't want that to happen. Okay. Now, also, uh, as I said earlier, always recommended to have a maintenance window for this. Uh, part of the process is that the devices will reboot. Very, very important thing to note is that if you encounter absolutely any issues with re the upgrade of the first FI, generally we upgrade the subordinate FI first, so if you encounter any issues with the upgrade of the first FI, do not proceed to upgrade the second one. It is likely that the second one may also have the same issue. So at that stage, please go ahead and stop the process and contact TAC immediately. Also, it is noteworthy that when you proceed to upgrade the second fabric interconnect, please make sure that your traffic is now up both FC as well as Ethernet traffic has come up via the first fabric interconnect. You have to sometimes give it a few minutes so that even when the FI reboots completely and uh, it shows 100%, it takes a few minutes so that all traffic starts passing again. So just give it those few minutes before we upgrade the second one. Okay. So now I hope the UCSM would have come back. So we'll uh, go back and just have a quick look at the the UCS manager once again, we'll see uh, what it now shows. Please give me a moment. I'm just opening the UCS manager and I'll uh, share my desktop in a moment. Okay. 
So now we can see that uh, you know the UCS manager upgrade. I'm sorry, I'll just share the video. So I hope um, everybody can see the screen now. Okay. So now uh, what we do see is that uh, if we go to the firmware management section once again, go to install firmware, uh, it refreshes. Now you can see the UCS manager has been upgraded to 222C. Okay. So now we'll proceed with the fabric interconnect. So once again, uh, Fabric Interconnect also do not uh, support the update operation. So we'll just go ahead with activate in here. Select Fabric Interconnect. Now, uh, it's very important to note that uh, we ideally suggest that uh, you upgrade the subordinate first, but that's um, not necessary. You can go ahead and do anyone. The only reason that we um, do the subordinate first is that we don't want our UCS management connectivity to uh, go off when the Fabric Interconnect reboots as the UCSM or the UCS manager is hosted on the primary. So now we'll go ahead and activate the primary Fabric Interconnect. So we'll select the firmware version as 222C and we click on apply. Sorry. My bad. Uh, so, of course, it's noteworthy that you have to select the same version for the kernel and system, and then, the, then only uh, it will succeed. So, it gives you the notice that it will reboot. So, you need to manually acknowledge that, yes, we want to do this. Now, it's started. Click on OK. So now, um, the firmware update is already in progress for the Fabric Interconnect uh, V, which is the subordinate. Okay. So it takes about 20, 25 minutes. So we'll go ahead and cover some rest of the uh, topics in, in the slides, and then we will uh, come back and I'll uh, you know, show you more about how do we do the blades and how do we uh, do the, uh, you know, the auto install. I'm just waiting for the screen to refresh for everyone. Okay. So now, uh, as we saw, uh, so we have activated the Fabric Interconnect. Um, okay. So when we activate the Fabric Interconnect, this automatically updates each and every IOM that's connected to it. So once the Fabric Interconnect reboots, it would take down all the IOMs that are connected to it, and they will all come together. Uh, they will all come up with a new firmware upgrade. Now, we also uh, would want to look at the blade firmware upgrade process, uh, which I, I skip. Uh, I don't know if the image is uh, visible uh, for everyone, but I'll quickly show you what we can do uh, for the blade firmware upgrade. Okay. So once again, I'll uh, jump back to sharing my desktop. I hope the screen has refreshed for everyone. So now, uh, the Blade firmware, that can be upgraded two ways. Either you can do it normally under firmware management. You can go to installed firmware. You can just expand it, select any blade that you want, and then go ahead and manually uh, update and then activate the firmware for each and every component. Okay, so you can select from here, select the CIMC, However, uh, we generally do not suggest this. The best way to upgrade the blade firmware is use the host firmware package. <laughs> I'll show you how it can be done. So the host firmware package uh, is, comes as a policy. Uh, this is available in the service tab. What we can do is we can create a host firmware package. So we'll create a host firmware package. We'll call it demo. So now we use the simple option. Uh, we'll just select the blade package, 222C, and that's all we have to do. We can go to the advanced option as well, wherein we can go ahead and select individual components firmware that we want to 
set, but uh, generally we just go with simple, click on OK, and now we click on. Now we see that the demo host package is created. Now, to perform the upgrade, uh, what we have to do is we have to go to the blade and, and select the host firmware packet that we have. So now, let's say we have selected this blade for upgrade. We click on the service profile for it. <coughs> okay, it just takes a minute to refresh. And we click on policies, we click on firmware policy, we see there's an option of host firmware package. Go ahead and select the demo here. This is our host firmware package. Now we can click on apply and then OK and the firmware would be upgraded. However, on the same setup, we have a firmware upgrade on the FI going on and we do not have the connectivity to one of the fabrics at this moment, so I will not be performing this operation. This is only for demo purpose. So um, similarly, um, you know, so this is how we perform the manual upgrade for the infrastructure as well as the blade components. Now we'll quickly have a look at how do we perform the auto install, which is the later option, which is now the recommended option, which is a much easier option, uh, and you know most people are now uh, you know just taking that instead of going ahead and manually doing things. Okay. So uh, as you can see, uh, if you click on equipment and go to firmware management. Firmware auto install is a separate tab on and by itself. Okay. So it has two very simple steps in terms of action. Install infrastructure firmware and then install server firmware. So I'm going to run through both so that you have an idea on what we do. So when we say ins install infrastructure firmware, it's pretty simple. Okay. Of course, uh, as it rightly suggests that there are some critical major faults. So it is Ideally suggested that you go ahead and uh, you know get rid of them or resolve them before we uh, proceed with the upgrade. But uh, if you do know what are they, and then you can just go ahead and ignore them and, and go to the next step. And in the next step, all you have to do is just select the infrastructure pack of firmware. So this, we select 222C. Now we see there are two options here. There's force, and then there's a start time and upgrade. <laughs> So the upgrade now option can be selected if you want to do it right now or if you can specify a time when you want to do an upgrade out of business hours or something. The force option um, is meant to force the upgrade. Sometimes if some sub-operations uh, within the upgrade process fail, so this would force them, this would try to uh, you know, retry those operations and make sure that the firmware upgrade completes. Now, since we already have a firmware upgrade running, as suggested or as I uh, demonstrated with the manual upgrade, we will not be doing this. This is only for demo, but there's nothing much to do after it. You click on finish and your infrastructure firmware upgrade is taken care of. You don't have to do any, uh, you know, any changes manually to all the IOMs. You don't have to do changes manually to the uh, system and uh, kernel images for the FI or the UCSM. It takes care of everything. Okay, similarly, uh, if you click on install server firmware for the auto install, okay, that's also a pretty simple step. Okay, so first uh, it also gives you a warning about some warnings, so we'll proceed with it. Now, it also um, asks you to provide you the version, so we'll select the version to do C. If you have any rack mounts, you can select the blade version. Right now, we do not, so we're not do going ahead with that. Now, these are the two important screens, uh, screen three and screen four. It shows select host from our packages. Now we have selected the version as 222C. If we select any host from our packages from here, for example, if we select demo, whatever demo had, I mean, we had, selected demo to have the package version 222C. But if it was an, at an earlier version, it would now be updated to have 222C as the package version. Now, when we go ahead and do this, it will show you the host trauma package <coughs> dependencies. Okay. Right now it's not showing anything, so we'll just quickly go back. Uh, because the demo is not associated to any of the service profiles, it was freshly created. So we'll uh, probably just go ahead and select something else so that I can uh, demonstrate what it will show. 
Okay. So when you select any of the host firmware packages, it shows all the service profiles that are using that host from a package that are going to be upgraded. So currently we see this one service profile which is going to be upgraded. Okay. So we click on next and now it shows a summary of all the endpoints uh, that are going to be impacted. So it might show you uh, a number of blades, uh, CIMCs, adapters, anything that currently needs an update that's going to be updated uh, when you do this. So at this stage you can uh, go ahead and just click on install and then it would do the rest of the process. Since, as I said, uh, it already has a FI upgrade running, so I won't be doing this, um, and this is only for demonstration. So we'll quickly uh, go back to the slides and uh, run through the, uh, you know, the auto-install procedure as well. And however, I'll also have a look at the FI as to what its situation right now. So we can see that it's almost done with the upgrade. At this stage, it reboots itself and uh, you know uses the new image. So this is what it's currently doing. It will take around 10, 15 more minutes to come back. So we'll now jump back to the slides and have a quick uh, recapitulation of uh, what we did uh, in the demo. So I'm just waiting a few seconds so that the screen refreshes for everyone. So uh, as we see, so firmware auto install, uh, you know, it has package versions uh, based on update for both uses infrastructure components. Okay, uh, it can be uh, cannot be used to upgrade the management extension and capability catalog. Uh, that's the device capability catalog that's compatible with the UCSM. So these are just simple updates. Uh, they are left under the user control. Okay, um, so. The firmware auto install is a two step procedure uh, compared to the many step procedure in the manual upgrade. It's much simpler. It's available 2.1 on onwards only, and uh, you can use. Now, uh, this is a quick um, recapitulation of the process. So, once you click on install infrastructure firmware, it will do the UCSM, it will uh, update the IOMs, it will take care of the uh, secondary fabric interconnect and then it will uh, come up with the option to reboot the primary in, uh, fabric interconnect. A couple of important things to note is that uh, when it gives you an option to reboot the primary interconnect, it does not check that the path has come up. So that is a check that the users, you know, uh, you know the person who is doing the upgrade has to manually check. So be very careful before we select the option of rebooting the primary FI. You have to ensure that the path is up from the second fabric. So this is how we do it. Uh, click on the pending activities and that fabric interconnect and click on reboot now. Uh, if I believe everyone can see that. Okay. Then of course install server firmware. We already saw that uh, we select uh, uh, that. So this is just a quick recapitulation of the steps that we go through. We select the package version post from a package, we see the service profile which are going to be associated uh, and updated, and then uh, we see the impacted endpoint summary in the end. Lastly, um, there's also a hardware upgrade procedure when sometimes you might want to switch from using the earlier version 6100 uh, fabric interconnect to the 6200 fabric interconnects that are available now. So there's an official document here. Uh, there are some uh, concerns around, uh, you know, the number of ports and how do you perform the grid. So uh, you have to be careful and follow the document very carefully, otherwise it can lead to a downtime. Okay, so with this, it, this concludes the UCS, uh, you know, upgrade part of it, and uh, I will hand it off to Varun from here, who will, uh, you know, cover the troubleshooting part. So. Uh, if you uh, have any questions, uh, please feel free to post in the Q&A panel. I'd be happy to answer them.
Hello guys, I hope the upgrade section was informative and you would be able to carry on the upgrade yourself. So let's get started with the UCS troubleshooting section. This is in general, I'm going to speak about UCS troubleshooting. We're done with the demo. Yeah. So these are the components. I'm just revising over the components. We have the UCS manager the fabric uh, interconnects the extenders that are your IMs, uh, your blade chassis the 5108 chassis that we spoke of and the bcd servers we are not going to concentrate on the c series troubleshooting in this session so uh, i just wanted to uh, clarify a few points before getting into the troubleshooting uh, whenever you there's something that's going wrong in the ucsm system you would see a fault being generated for it uh, there are some uh, attributes associated to the fault, like what the severity. It can be either critical, major, minor, warning, or it could be just information. It will also, uh, if you look at the fault, it will let you know what state transition it has gone through, what is the affected object. Every fault has a unique ID, a type, and it will also list when it is clear. There's also a unique fault code. It always starts with F, and you can, it's uh, with that same fault code, if you search on any of this uh, CCO site or if you just Google it, it will take you to CCO and you can identify what, what went wrong and why was this fault generated. It will at least give you a brief idea. So uh, the slide is, uh, yeah, I'll show it from here. So here you can see, you can see the severity out here. This is major out here. Red means critical. This is major, minor, and this is a warning. So as you can see out here, you can see that you're seeing a fault type major out here. What is the affected object? It will give you a brief description. The affected object is uh, in chassis one. It's in blade four connected to fabric A. That is one of the VFC, the WIF interfaces down. It will give you the reason it is not known to it. And the type is network. It, it can be network, it's impacting the network. So yeah, the highest severity is major at the moment and the number of occurrences is one and when was this fault created it was created on 3rd of december 2010 so it gives the same thing uh it, this is the unique id that i was speaking of this is the ID that's uniquely assigned to each fault and this is the fault id this is this you can search with it starts with f you can have a look at the fault id and this will if you can uh, search for any document on cc you'll get a brief information of why do we get this fault so this is, if you double click on any of the faults out here, right, if you double click on them, it will open, open a new window, a pop-up window for you. On the pop-up window, you can see what the same fields, uh, it just points to one particular fault. As here, you can see there's one informational fault also. It just states what happened, why did it log that fault. It's related to the logging capacity of the management controller on this server is very low. So again, the, uh, you can see what is the affected object and everything that we discussed. This is a fault code, F0461. This is very informative. You can search or you can have TAC have it search for you. You can see the fault from the CLI. The command, this is the UCSM context. We are going to speak about the various contexts. For right now, as soon as you log in into FI, you can just give show fault. You will see all the faults that are present on the system right now. And if you type in the fault ID, you get the information, more uh, specific information about that particular fault. So let's get started with the actual troubleshooting. I explained you what is fault, how to view them, what are the severities. Now let's concentrate on one module in particular and let's troubleshoot it. For example, if there's something wrong with the UCSM, Fabric Interconnect, what should you look for? And what are the various commands that you should check? Let's have a look at it. So basically your UCS, the UCS system, uh, when you log in into your FIs, you have three contexts. By default, when you log in into a switch, for example, the N5K, you just have the NXOS context. Out here, you, we have three different contexts. One is your UCSM context that's used for scoping, that's used for gathering the hardware information for the server or anything related to hardware on the UCS. NXOS, that is, as I said earlier, you cannot configure, like as you normally configure your N5K switch, FI is only a read only for NXOS prompt. You can configure it using the UCSM. And also the third prompt that is your management or the local management prompt that is used for debugging on the UCSM that's used for collecting the tech support files. And it's also used for rebooting or erasing the context. It's the dangerous prompt I would say. 
So as you can see out here, uh, this is from the UCSM prompt. As we said earlier, from the UCSM prompt, you can use the scope command. So when you scope, you can scope into individual device. You, these are the options that you get to scope into. So I'll take an example out here. Here I'm scoping into a chassis. If I have one chassis, and also to mention, you can have maximum of 20 chassis in a cluster. 20 chassis, uh, that's the restriction at the moment, with fully eight loaded blades. So in all, 160 blades, right? So if you scope into chassis, you can scope into the server and you can scope into the adapter. And from there, you can retrieve all the information, the hardware specifics, the NICs that you have configured, VNICs. I mean to say the VNICs out here, the virtual NICs and the virtual HDs. Uh, this is, it speaks about connect. The connect command is used to get into the NXOS prompt. So uh, the connect NXOS, if you just type in connect NXOS and your fabric interconnect B is your primary fabric interconnect, it will take you to that fabric interconnect or else you can just type in connect nx os a that will take you to the subordinate in case a is your subordinate so with the uh, whatever fabric uh, you want to connect you need to just get in connect nx os a or b also you can use connect to get into your uh, local management the command is connect local management again a or b it will take you either on the a side of the fabric interconnect or the b side of the fabric interconnect Yeah, this is what you do when you can run to when you connect to an as I told you earlier. It's like the switch prompt of the FI. So you can uh, check the running configs of the interface. You can clear the counters. You can uh, uh, check the QS configuration. All show commands, as in they work in N5K, would work in this prompt. The only exception being you cannot configure anything from the NXOS prompt. Um, yeah, connect local management as I stated earlier. If you connect to local management, you can erase, you can give the command erase config and you can erase the entire FI. You can reboot the fabric interconnect and there are other various options that you can. You can also from the UCSM prompt, you can connect to adapter. This is also a very important command and through which you can view the VNX and the HVAs that you have configured. Okay, when you're concentrating on the UCSM troubleshooting, the first thing when, you, when you're setting up a setup, you need the chassis discovery policy. It's there under the equipment tab, under the global policies. So the chassis discovery policy enables you, uh, it helps you uh, tell the FI that I'm connecting a chassis to my FM, and uh, these men, with these many minimum links, you can discover my chassis. For example, here the chassis discovery policy is set to two. And if I connect only one server port from the FI to the chassis, and if only one link is operational, my chassis will not be discovered. So in that case, you can change your chassis discovery policy to one and then get your chassis discovered. So basically what it does is it's, it lets the UCSM know that these are the minimum links that I expect from to be present between the chassis and the FI. However, the, these are not the only links that would be used for data traffic, but these are the minimum ones to be used for the discovery. Another important, uh, have, if you have uh, ever had a chance to open the KVM, KVM is keyboard video mo uh, mouse. So have you, if you have had any chance to open the server KVM, this is also a very useful thing for us. If you can take a screenshot, you can see out here, if you can take a screenshot of the KVM and send it across to us in case your blade's not booting up, this will help us better troubleshoot the issue and solve issues quicker. The logs that we need uh, for UCSM troubleshooting would be so tech support UCSM detail, which will give us everything, all the logs are related to UCSM. If you give show tech support chassis and the hash out there stands for the chassis number, for example, it can be 1, 2, 20. So it will give only details relevant to that chassis. So that will help us troubleshoot issues related to the chassis that is related to IM and the blades. Networking issues, you can just give show tech support details. This is quite similar to your N5K output. This will just give the switching part of it. Fan issues, you can give us show tech support. NPV, NPV because the fabric interconnects by default are in NPV mode. So that is why we need the NPV tech support. For the UCSM to be accessible, please have a look at this slide. These ports need to be allowed. These We cannot deny any of these ports for the operations of UCSM. 21, 22 for FTB, 23 for Telnet, 53 for DNS, 123 for NTB, 80 for TCP, 61, 62 UDP ports in case you're using SNMP, 443 in case of HTTPS, 514 if your syslog is enabled, 623 if you're using IPMI or serial overlap, and the most important, 2068 for KVM. 
Remember, TCP port 2068 is used for KVM. So if you're not able to launch your KVM, be sure that this port is enabled on your firewall. So let's move ahead to the FI troubleshooting now. Uh, these are the cluster, uh, these are the commands that you would test for FI. So yeah, we are running out of time, so let's uh, cover it quickly, guys. So show cluster extended state. You can uh, check it, uh, check the cluster state. Show FSM, that is a finite state machine. It's uh, everything is, is like, it goes to a sequence of events, so you can check what's happening on a particular device. PMON state will give you the process monitoring. Uh, in case if there's something wrong in the process, one of the processes hung or stuck, you can check show codes to check if an, it, it generated some codes for you and show management IP debug is used for management interface troubleshooting. So this is the output of a show cluster extended state if both the FIs are up and working perfectly fine. So in this case you can see your A is your primary, B is your subordinate. These are your L1, L2, the, we spoke about those connections. This is the idle state, HRAD, and these chassis have been discovered. Show PMON state and please mind the context, the show PMON state will work from local management. And the previous command, it can work from local management or from the UCSM context. So if you go to connect local management and check the P1 state, you see that ideally all the states should be running. In case if there's something wrong, you can see that either the process code something, then it generated dumps, so you, you would see yes here. And you would also see the signal type. Let's move ahead to the blade servers. So with uh, blade servers, the two components that we are going to look right now is the CIMC and the BIOS. I guess you might be aware of CIMC, but I'll re uh, reiterate it for you. It's a Cisco integrated management controller. It is used for monitoring the temperature, power, reading the sensors, everything for the blade. KVM and vMedia is managed to CIMC, blade control basic. BIOS, all of us are aware of, we have BIOS on our computers also through UCS. If you want to configure the BIOS for the server, you can either press F2 and the blade boots or else you can have BIOS policy configured on your UCSM. So OBFL logs, these are the logs that we look in for. This is one of the files in the show tech support. Uh, this shows the hardware logs for different components. If you want, you can review it to get some more insight or else you can share the tech support with us and we'll do it for you. Uh, similarly, system event logs. Uh, system event logs, uh, repo, uh, it uh, as a server has uh, three endpoints that you're going to concentrate in a server on. The memory unit, that is your DIMMs, the processors, and the motherboard, the system board that we are going to speak. So basically your BIOS, the base management controller, and the OS log hardware platform related specific informations in the cell logs. So if you want anything that's related to the hardware, you can get this from here. Also the post, the power on cell test, and the runtime errors are reported in your cell. It's the most effective tool for monitoring the health of your server. So the cell logs can be viewed, uh, you, this is how it's viewed, if you go to the cell logs, and it's under the chassis, if you go to cell logs, you can view it, and you can refresh it, clear it. Uh, we also have a cell policy that you can configure, the cell policy will let you know, uh, you can export your cell logs in case your logs are full or you want to clear them. So you can set up the backup interval, you can use either of the protocols, FTP, STP, SCP, and SFTP, in case you want to... Uh, these are the protocols that we support to export these cell logs. So OS connectivity, this is one of the important issues. I've just brought it up from Blade because at times it might be have, uh, your, your everything is up on the hardware perspective from the UCSM, but your OS is not able to detect the NICs or the VHBAs. So you need to be very sure that you have the right kind of drivers running on the blades. So we have a uh, B series compatibility metrics wherein you can check for your particular blade and the uh, CNA or the storage rate controller, whatever you're using for um, getting the compatibility metrics so that you can upgrade your drivers accordingly and so that everything works smoothly. So for example, uh, you can, i just taken an example, if you're using B200 or B250 M1 M2 blades with M81 or MIG card and your operating system is vSphere 4.0, so your adapter driver version should be this, this is your eNIC, this is for your Ethernet and this is for your FNIC, that is for your VHBs and this is the adapter firmware, this is on the UCSM point, uh, point of view, this is from the OS point of view. So you need to be sure that your adapter driver is there. So the second part, I wanted to just let you know about the DIMM troubleshooting, the memory troubleshooting. Again, you can use uh, tech support, cell event logs. 
So there are different kind of memory errors that can be due to ECC errors, parity error, or the serial presence detector error, or it could be due to configuration. You are using not supported DIMM, so you have not populated the DIMM as per the re uh, release notes, the spec sheets that we have. So the DIMM errors can be seen on the server. If you go to statistics, you can see the error stats out there. You can see what why is the DIMM erroring. It can be due to parity issues, multi-bit error, single-bit error, or mismatch errors. You can also view it from the CLI. This is a command to check that. Uh, not uh, in the scope of interest of time. I'll not cover the DIMMs in detail. But yeah, the DIMMs, and uh, you can see what status reporting is done at the UCSM level and BMC level in the BIOS. If the DIMM is operable, it shows degraded. However, it is equipped. So that means a correctable error. This is a correctable error. You don't need to replace the DIMM. In case it is degraded and it's inoperable at the UCSM level, uh, that means it has encountered a multi-bit error and you can, it might need a hardware replacement. Uh, blade discovery, uh, first thing, why is the blade not getting discovered? First thing you need to check whether you've powered on the blade. As the, you can check that, you can connect to the CIMC from the UCSM context, check the power. You can check for the sensor readings out here from the CIMC context. And then uh, you can also view the post results on, the, if you go to the blade, you can see out here, you can see view post results. You can disable quiet boot, this will help you in troubleshooting, so it will help you uh, view the logs, what are happening. Uh, Blade server, common prof issues, there, there can be a config failure when you associate a service profile to a blade. This could be due to insufficient resources, like if you have configured four NICs and you're using a QLogic NIC adapter card. So in that case, you can ma have max two, or if you're using Cisco VIX and you move the service profile to another blade which has some other network adapters, so in that case, due to mismatch, you cannot have, the blade does not have sufficient resources, then you can get a config failure. They could be fault due to uplink connectivity issues as well. So this is what the blade startup. This is the utility OS that uh, when you associate a blade to a service profile, it will undergo a sequence of events. You can see it's discovering. These are the logs that you can events that you can check. And this is if you check the KVM out here, you would see this. This is again showing the same thing from the KVM, what you would see. Uh, chassis, sometimes you see that the chassis slot, it says read res resolution. It can arise when you're moving a blade from one chassis to another. It's at this step, you can uh, either decommission the blade and re it. It should fix it. If, if not, you can contact TAC. So these are the top five commands that we discussed off. You can have a look at them. Uh, let's get going to the IM and chassis troubleshooting. The CMC response, uh, what is the IM? IMC basically consists of a chassis management controller. That's used for chassis discovery because uh, if you see the C from out here, this is used for maintaining the cluster state out here. Uh, the fabric ports and the HIF, uh, you remember we spoke about the host interfaces and the network interfaces. So the Redwood ASIC is the one that's responsible for maintaining them. These are your uh, HIF ports, these are your NIF. So chassis not discovering, as I told you, one is to one relationship between the IM and the FM, be sure on that. The command to check the interfaces, these interfaces is show interface fix fabric. This is again from your NXOS uh, context. Or you can check the show fix and the chassis ID, depending on whatever chassis number, you can check the commands. Uh, fan issues or power issues, uh, you can, uh, um, there are logs being generated. You can send across the chassis tech support to us and we'll help it, help you out with it. I just wanted to let you know that we also, as N5K and other switching modules, we also have ETH Analyzer. This is, mind you, ETH Analyzer will, uh, it's used to collect only the control plane traffic. So ETH Analyzer can be configured from the NXOS context. I've just taken an example. So ETH inborn low is used for, you can, uh, it uses ETH 3, that is used for IGMP and CDP packets. ETH 4 can be used for FC, STP, LACP, DCB extra protocols. The commands are pretty much the same as N5K. You can have a look at them. So yeah, how to collect the tech support? You can go to the admin tab, fault, audit, and then the event log section. From there, you can generate the tech support. You can give us the UCSM tech support or the chassis tech support. Please select the chassis IV, and also you can give us the CIMC in case you're, there's some problem with your blade. Or if you're facing some issues with the IM, you can collect the chassis IM tech support and send it across to us. These are the list of bugs um, that we are hitting right now due to the uh, latest upgrades. The uh, the one that's impacted us a lot is on the FI into the loader prompt. Loader prompt is something that is, the switch does not have the image, uh, the system and the kernel image. So this is a bug related. You can have a look at these bugs. Uh, TAC has the workaround in case you end up into any of these states. Please call us, we'll help you from there. So this is, uh, 
a few of the reference uh, links that you can keep them handy in case you run into any issues. You can contact us and you can look at them. So this is our third polling question. Feel free to answer. Uh, let us know whether you're using 1000V with uh, the UCS. So guys, I'm done with the troubleshooting section. We, we can have a look at the slides in case you find you have doubts in any of them. Do reach out to us uh, through the Ask the Expert community and we'll uh, help you out. Thank you guys. Thank you. So the polling question is open on the right hand side of the console. The question is, do you have Nexus 1000V installed on a UCS environment? There are four options. So please take a moment and Okay, so I think it was a great presentation with a lot of demo. Uh, we are running short of time, but uh, uh, thank you everyone for the event polling. Now, um, I think some of the questions have been answered, so we don't have time for the, uh, the live Q&A. But uh, please uh, make sure, uh, if you can stay for the rest of the uh, presentation, please make sure to submit the evaluation, which will pop up once you leave the meeting. Okay, so Varun and Anupam will be hosting an Ask the Expert discussion that will last through September 24th. The link is pasted in the chat window. If you have additional questions, log in to Cisco Support Community and go to the Expert Corner. You can find that discussion which is live now. So uh, you can post the questions and they will be responding. Till September 24th, the event will run. And in the in the some of uh, some of the promotions we have asked the trivia question. So let's see who uh, you know what was your response for that question. I will close the polling question three, and then open up the trivia question. So there are three options. The question was what does Sonic and the Hedgehog and the Cisco Unified Computing System share in common? There are three options. So just give me a second, I'll open the trivia question. Again, that is open on the right hand side in the polling window. So let's see who got the right answer. We'll share the result in a bit. So there are a few upcoming webcasts. Uh, the next one is uh, ESA Configuration and Troubleshooting Training, September 22nd, 10 a.m. Pacific time. The second one is on October 21st. The topic is Connected Analytics for network deployment with Cisco subject matter expert, June. And it, it will take place at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And the registration link I've pasted in the chat, so you can access that and register for this event if you're interested. There is an Ask the Expert, which is currently running. The topic is configuring and troubleshooting 802.1x and it's open for questions, and our expert Xavier will be responding to your questions. This event will run till September 26th. Okay, so if you have, haven't already logged into Cisco Support Community, we encourage you to do so. We have a brand new look and feel, so log in and start sharing today. Also, be sure to check out the class of 2014 Event Stock Contributor on the Cisco Support Committee. If you are interested in conducting an event for us and becoming a top event contributor yourself, please go to the Expert Bureau and sign up for that. And uh, as you know, we, we have uh, uh, the social media presence. So we encourage you to visit the community and join us through any of these channels that are listed on the slide. And uh, we have other languages communities like Spanish, Portuguese, Japanese, Russian, and recently lost Chinese. So if you speak any of these languages, feel free to collaborate in your local language. And uh, you may take a moment to rate the content that is existing in Cisco Support Committee today. All the videos, blogs, documents. By doing so, you'll help us recognize the wonderful content. 
and also the experts will get that recognition. Okay, so it's time to answer the trivia question. And I see many, okay, so maximum responses are for the, for the option C, which is the correct answer. That is Cisco Unified Computing System was eventually chosen due to its ability to run all 400 of Sega's server. So thank you. And I'll share the polling result with you. So before signing off, please take a few minutes to complete your evaluation or survey for today's session. This will help us address your business needs and interests for the future. And this concludes our session today. Thank you to our experts, Varun, Anupam, and Avinash for responding to all the questions and sharing their expertise. I think it was a great demo for all the users. Uh, we will be posting the recording of the video within the next five business days in the, in the community. So you can uh, view that recording and also the questions that came in, we'll be creating a FAQ document. So thank you everyone and have a wonderful day.